I'm Matt B. Sharp with NARIT here in Hollywood, Florida for NARIT's ReWise, the 2018 Law, Accounting, and Finance Conference. Joining me today is Kristen Naughton, Senior Director of Financial Reporting and Technical Accounting with AIMCO. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, the effective date for the Financial Accounting Standard Board's new revenue from con contracts with customers is now upon us. Can you describe your company's efforts to implement this new revenue standard? What we did was, a couple years ago, we had intended to adopt both the lease standard and the revenue standard at the same time. So in anticipation of doing everything together, we didn't bifurcate between the different types of contracts. What we did was we evaluated our entire GL, looked at all of the income that we record, and then we grouped each of our GL accounts by uh, type of contract. And lo and behold, like I'm sure most REITs discovered, we found that substantially all of our revenue comes from contracts from leases with our residents. So <laughs> to scope the rest of it, and knowing that we had to evaluate that under the lease standard, to scope the rest of the the income that we had, we looked at the different types and the different contracts. We set a materiality threshold and anything below that threshold we didn't even bother. And that worked out to be about half a percent of our total revenue items in our in our annual budget. So looking at that, we really only had two types of contracts other than our lease contracts that generated any kind of significant income. And as we dug into it, Lo and behold, they were both leases. <laughs> One was related to laundry rooms in our communities where we lease the laundry room to a vendor who then pays us a percentage of their sales for the coin-op washers and dryers. And then the other part comes from telecommunications companies who want to provide services to our residents. So we lease them a space on our property and then we lease them access to the infrastructure within our walls so that they can access our residents. And we get a percentage of whatever their penetration is and whatever they're getting from our residents. But it, that's under the old lease standard. So we got lucky because as far as revenue goes, we didn't really have to do anything this year because <laughs> um, everything else is really de minimis. Now, I understand that there will be a change in how partial sales of real estate are treated. Can you provide an overview of what the change in guidance is and how REITs will be impacted? Yeah, I'm actually kind of excited about this one. This is a, a real improvement from a measuring or ma matching the economics of a transaction with the way the accounting actually works. Under the old rules, so in 2017, if a REIT were to take a property that it owned and put it into a joint venture with a private equity firm, and even if it ceded control, say you've got a $100,000 property with a $50,000 basis, you put it into a joint venture and retain 25% interest, you'd get $75,000 in cash, and you'd get 25% of the equity in the new partnership. Under in 2017, that accounting would have resulted in a gain calculated on the $75,000 of cash compared to 75% of your basis. So you'd get a $37,500 um, gain recognition. And then you would take the, the net of what's left over in that property and record it as your investment in. So while you've got a $25,000 value asset, you have to record it at 12 and a half. So it doesn't really match up because you, you gave up a $100,000 value property to, to get something back, but you couldn't recognize that until you ultimately sold your interest in that partnership. So same transaction this year under the new rules, because we get rid of the special treatment for real estate in sales with the new standard, what it, you end up doing is taking your $100,000 of value that re you receive in the form of cash and partnership, and you compare that to the $50,000 basis, you record your $50,000 in gain, and then you get a 50, the $25,000 um, value of that partnership, you get to reflect that as your investment in. So as far as REITs go, if they're interested in financing through private equity, um, I think it's a lot more attractive because it's a lot easier to explain to our investors why that makes sense. <laughs> so I, I like the, the new change because I think it, it does make that story easier to tell and you aren't reconciling that basis difference. Now that the 
new revenue standard has been adopted, do REITs have to start accounting for non-lease components under the revenue standard if they haven't adopted the new lease standard? <laughs> <laughs> if they haven't adopted the lease standard, that is the, the key point to that. Um, no, actually they don't. And that's a question that I've received quite a few times um, just with folks in the in AIMCO. Um, because the non-lease component concept is introduced by the new lease standard, as long as we're accounting for the leases under the old lease standard, there's no requirement to start accounting for non-lease components, even though they are subject to 606 once we adopt the new lease standard. The other interesting piece about whether what you adopt during the, the lease standard versus revenue is also related to the cost of obtaining that lease. There's a, a change related to the cost of obtaining a contract that will be effective once we adopt the lease standard, but as of now, it's the same old, same old status quo. We get to continue to capitalize all those costs that we've been capitalizing and deferring over the life of the lease. And lastly, the new leases standard will be effective for 2019. How's your company begun evaluating the standard and are there required disclosures to be made in advance of that adoption? Well, as I mentioned, we started looking at it a couple of years ago, so we, we are quite, quite a bit ways into our evaluation of the lease standard. Um, but there are definitely disclosures as we get closer to the effective date. Um, to the extent that companies aren't quite as far along and didn't have robust disclosures in their 10K, as we file 10Qs this year, the SEC and our auditors, quite frankly, are going to expect to see updated disclosures about the effect of that new standard um, to the extent that it's material. Now, keeping in mind that 10Q is an update document, so if we were as far along as AIMCO was at the end of the year, we included fairly robust disclosures in our 10K, and only to the extent that we adopt or we evaluate the changes coming, there's a, an ASU that we're expecting to be issued as a result of the exposure draft from January. Um, if that changes anything that we had concluded in our 10K and disclosed in our 10K, we would update that disclosure. Great. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. For more from Nareed's REITWISE, be sure to visit Nareed's website, REIT.com.